Hello everyone. We have seen that statistics are used widely in decision making in various sectors. But sometimes statistics can be misleading and may favor one opinion over another. In this lesson, we will look at how sample selection affects statistical conclusions. Before my cover gets here, I'd like us to go through some background information about what we're going to look at today. We see statistics used every day for different purposes and in different ways. Politicians, advertisers, researchers and other people use statistics as a powerful tool to support their argument. But the fact that data is being used to support an argument does not mean that statistics are being used correctly. When people have a strong preference for one point of view, we say that they are biased toward that point of view and against different points of view. People often use statistics in a way that supports their own point of view and does not present the full picture of the situation. When they do this, we say that they're introducing bias into the data. When people present or interpret data in a biased way to achieve a particular purpose, we say that they are manipulating data. Data can be manipulated when it is collected and when it is represented graphically. Remember, the aim of collecting and representing data is to provide information about the true situation. So it's important to understand how bias can be introduced into the data and how to prevent this from happening. Makeva, why don't you start by explaining exactly what it is that you're researching? Okay, well, the Learners' Representative Council at our school mm -hmm. has asked the school governing body to scrap the school uniform, but the school governing body doesn't really like the idea. Our teachers suggested we do some research to find out what people in the community really think about this. If most people agree, then you can persuade the school governing body to scrap the uniform. I think it's a good idea, but I'm not sure everyone will agree. This means that you're going to have to be very careful about not introducing bias when you collect your data. Bias? Do you mean that I must make sure that I don't collect information simply to prove that my opinion is the most popular? That is it exactly. In order to trust your statistics, it's always important to ask questions about who collected the information, how the information was collected, and why the information was collected, or what the purpose of the survey was. But why is that important? I mean, people should accept that I'm honest and the numbers are real. I'm not a dishonest person, and numbers never lie. Well, think about it this way. Even though you are an honest person, if you're not careful, you may put things in a way that reflects your view without even realizing that you are doing it. Also, the SGB, in order to be fair, need to be sure that the survey really does reflect the general view and that the decision they make is representative of the majority of people it'll affect. In order to do that, they need to ask questions about your survey. Oh, I see what you're saying. So if the SGB asks these questions about my survey, I'll need to convince them that my data is not biased because they have to make sure they're being fair to everyone. Yes, that's right. It's clear that you have a particular purpose in the survey, to collect data that shows the SGB that most people want to scrap school uniforms. So when they ask who, they might realize that the person doing the data collection has a particular point of view. And when they ask why, they'll realize that the survey was intended to support this point of view. Well, if you want them to be persuaded by the results of your survey, you must be able to show that your bias has not influenced the way the data was collected and that the findings can be trusted. Mm, that's true, I suppose. But how can I make sure that my views are not influencing the data? Well, to start with, you need to be clear about which groups of people are affected by the issue. It's likely that different groups will have different views, and so you need to satisfy the SGB that all points of view were included when the data was collected. Why don't you write a list about who you think would be affected by this issue? Well, I guess it affects the whole community. That's me and my friends, and all the other learners at school. Then there are the teachers. I don't think they'll like the idea of getting rid of uniforms. And then, oh yes, they're the parents who have to buy the uniforms. I guess they should have a say. Good. You have identified that there are three groups of people that will be affected by this issue. Now, have you collected any information yet? Yes, I did a bit of survey and four out of five learners say that school uniforms should go. That sounds quite impressive. How many learners did you ask? I asked a sample of 10 people. 
And how many learners are in your school? I have a number list of all the learners in the school. There are 1,245 learners. I see. And how did you choose a sample? I asked 10 of my friends during break. See, I recorded the results. Only two of them didn't agree that we should get rid of school uniforms. Well, there's a few problems with this approach. Let's go through them. And while we go through them, why don't you start to make a list of rules for planning a survey? Remember, the aim of a survey is to find out about the true situation. So your survey will have to be representative of all the learners in your school. Do you mean I have to ask all 1,245 learners at my school? That will take forever. You're right. You can't ask everyone. But your survey needs to ask a representative sample of people. So let's make that the first rule. The sample must be representative of the whole population. One of the problems is that your sample is very small. 10 learners is less than 1% of the learners at your school. Oh, I didn't really think about it like that. I mean, 10 out of 1,200 people isn't really enough for a representative sample. But is there a rule for how big a sample should be? Unfortunately, there isn't a simple rule for sample size. A general guideline of 10% of the population is often stated. The thinking here is that if you include 10% of the population in your survey, then it is likely that you will include people with various opinions, and so your sample can be said to be representative. But it's not always that simple, and you need to consider sample size carefully at the planning stage of a survey. The ideal sample size also depends on how many different groups of people with different expected responses form the population that you want to collect data from. Generally, if you know that there are no big differences in your population, then your sample size can be small. But if you expect big differences in your population, then you need to increase your sample size. Oh, okay. So does that mean because the people that I'll be interviewing are most likely to give me different opinions? should I increase my sample size to more than 10%? Yes, but in this case, just having more people in your sample isn't enough. You also need to ensure that each group is fairly represented. It wouldn't be a representative sample if you only surveyed, uh, say, 30% of the learners and didn't ask either the parents or the teachers. A better way to deal with a population of such distinct groups is to select an equal fraction of each group to make up the sample. So I should take 10% of each group. So I could select 10% of each of the three groups, the learners, the teachers, and the parents. That would give me a bigger sample and also ensure that each of the three groups is represented. Yes. A sample like this made up of people of each group in the whole population is called a stratified sample. So our first rule for a representative sample that you can write down is choose an appropriate sample size. And the second is use a stratified sample if there are identifiable groups in the population. Right, so what's the next rule? Well, we've dealt with the problem that the size of the sample you originally chose was too small and that you only surveyed learners. But there is another problem. Your sample only included your immediate group of friends. Can you see what the problem is with that selection procedure? Hmm. Well, I suppose me and my friends like the same things, so they will probably agree with me about school uniforms. Which means? That my sample wasn't really representative because my friend's views doesn't represent all the views of the learners at school. Good, now you're getting it. But if I increase the sample size to 10% of the learners, won't that solve the problem? Well, it'll go part of the way, but it won't be enough on its own. How you choose your sample is of vital importance. If you were to choose your 10% from learners who are untidily dressed and don't obey school rules, what kind of result do you think you would get? I guess most of them would prefer not to wear school uniforms. Exactly. The same would be true if 10% of the parents you chose were the parents your friends told you agreed that there shouldn't be any school uniform. Similarly, if you only included those teachers who you felt were more likely to agree that there shouldn't be any school uniforms in the 10% of teachers in your sample. It would be like going to a soccer stadium and asking the people there if they enjoy soccer. 
If you went somewhere else, you would be likely to get a different answer to the same question. Wow, I didn't realize how difficult it is to do this without being biased. It's so easy and tempting to include people that will agree with you in the sample. I think you're starting to understand what bias is all about. The person collecting the data needs to choose a method that will prevent them from selecting the sample in a biased way. If you are going to take data collection seriously, you need to choose a random sample. A random sample gives every person in each group an equal chance of being selected for the sample. Well, I suppose I will need a random sample if I want the SGB to take my reading seriously. But how do I go about selecting the sample? One way of doing this is to use the list of names of the learners in your school. You could also get a list of all the parents' names and all the teachers' names. These lists are numbered, which gives us a convenient method for selecting a random sample. But how do the numbers help us? Well, the numbers give us a way to choose people without knowing who they are. It's very important not to look at the names themselves when you select your sample. You might know the people and who they are, and that might influence whether you choose them or not. That sounds simple, but how do I pick the people using the numbers? Let me explain by using your list of learners as an example, but the same methods can be used for selecting parents and teachers too. One method is to write all the numbers from 1 to 1,245 in the case of learners on small pieces of paper. Mix them all up together in a bag and draw numbers out of the bag without looking until you have the correct sample size. Then take the numbers and find the people on the list that match these numbers. Oh, there is another way. You want 10% of the learners in your sample which means that you want one out of every 10 of the learners on your list. So you could decide to choose every 10th learner in your numbered list. These people make up your randomly selected sample. Once you've chosen their names, you cannot change them because if you do, their selection will not be random anymore. Oh, that's very clever. This way of picking people relies on chance and not on my own judgment. So they are really randomly selected. Right, now let's look at the rules for selecting a representative sample again. We know that we need a sufficient sample size, a stratified sample, and now we can add that we need to select a random selection of the sample. Sample selection can greatly affect the data that comes out. Think about it. If we wanted to prove that a certain box of cereal was what most people bought, we could target only the people who already had the product in their trolley. Makes you think, doesn't it? Thank you for joining us, Grade 10s. Remember to look at the tasks for this section in the Discovering Statistics task video. You'll also be able to learn more about statistics on our website, www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Hopefully understanding bias in statistics will buy us some good grades. Bye bye now.